Well, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm David Levy. I'm the director of the Bolch Judicial Institute. I used to be the dean of the law school. It's, uh, my distinct honor and pleasure to introduce uh, Justice David Collins. Um, you know, if you're a rap star, you get to add an adjective after your name. You know, you get to be the creator. Uh, and I was thinking that David is so thoughtful, he should be David Collins, the thinker. <laughs> uh, he's very distinguished. He's, uh, he was the Solicitor General for New Zealand. Then he served on the High Court in New Zealand, which is actually the low court, or it's actually the high part of the low court, <laughs> yeah. the Dickensian touch, uh, that you have to go to law school to understand <laughs> that when we talk about the high court, we actually mean the low court. Uh, everybody knows probably that in New York, the Supreme Court is actually the trial court, and the, the Court of Appeals is the Supreme Court. Makes it all very lovely and confusing. But, uh, you get your money's worth when you go to law school because you learn about that stuff. And then, uh, very recently, it was promoted to the Court of Appeals, which is the intermediate appellate court in New Zealand, just under uh, Supreme, not the, yes, the Supreme Court, which is, in fact, the highest court. And uh, what what is so wonderful uh, in our relationship with uh, the justice is that he is our student. And he was, uh, he has an LLM from, from Duke, from our Judicial Studies program. He wrote his dissertation on uh, competency in criminal cases, which has been published by Law and Contemporary Problems, among other places, I think. Yeah. So please welcome Justice David Collins. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, David. And it's a wonderful privilege to be back at Duke University, one of the most uh, wonderful law schools in the world, and I'm very privileged to, uh, to be associated with it. My intention is to speak for about 25 minutes, um, and then uh, encourage as much debate and questioning as, as I'm able to. I'll set the scene by examining what happened when President Obama nominated Judge Garland to the Supreme Court in 2016. I'll examine the history of how the uh, size of the court has changed um, and uh, President Franklin Roosevelt's ill-fated court packing plan. And then I will deal with why court packing is a fraught idea uh, because court packing risks uh, further undermining the court's reputation. It risks undermining the rule of law but most substantially it further undermines uh, valuable but highly fragile conventions. When news broke on the 13th of February 2016 that Justice Scalia had passed away, I, like most students of constitutional affairs, was saddened by the loss of a judicial icon. That sadness was compounded, however, when a few hours later Senator McConnell announced that Justice Scalia's uh, successor should be appointed by the next president. Mr. McConnell argued that the electorate should have the opportunity to influence who the next Supreme Court justice should be, even though President Obama had a further 11 months to serve in office. I'll refer to what happened in 2016 as the 2016 strategy. That strategy required the appointment clause to be interpreted as meaning two things. First, that it is for the Senate to determine when and under what circumstances an appointment to the Supreme Court shall occur. And secondly, that the Senate has no obligation to consider a President's nomination to fill a vacancy on the Supreme Court. I was intrigued to ascertain on what basis this interpretation of Article 2, Section 2, uh, how it could be justified. Five reasons appear to have been advanced by uh, Republican leaders in the Senate and those who have endorsed the 2016 strategy. And those five reasons appear to be the following. First, that the words advice and consent imply that the Senate has the authority to determine whether or not it should consider a nomination. Second, 
as the Senate does not have to confirm a nomination, then impliedly the Senate does not have to consider a nomination. Third, the appointments clause does not say the Senate shall give its advice and consent, leaving room, it is said, for the Senate to decide under its rules and procedures whether or not to consider a nomination. Fourth, the appointments clause is silent on the procedure that the Senate is to follow when a president makes a nomination, and it is said that this void is filled by Article 1, Section 5, which empowers the Senate to determine the rules of its procedures. And then through this rulemaking power, the Senate can de determine whether or not to consider a president's nomination. <coughs> and finally, it has also been uh, argued that as Congress can increase or decrease the size of the Supreme Court, then the Senate can legitimately control the size of the Supreme Court by withholding consideration of the nomination. Now, I don't want to detract from the main focus of my presentation by engaging too deeply with each of these arguments. I will confine myself to making seven points. First, it's trite, but it needs to be said that uh, construction arguments that rely on implied meanings must yield to the plain meaning of the text of the Constitution. And there are three relevant parts to Article 2, Section 2, namely the requirement that the President shall nominate, secondly, that the President shall appoint, and thirdly, that the appointment shall be made by the President with the advice and the consent of the Senate. The role of the Senate to advise and consent is therefore in the context of the President being required to nominate and to appoint justices to the court. Thus that it is the President and not the Senate who determines when a vacancy on the court is actually filled, following of course the advice and consent from the Senate. The insistence uh, inherent in the 2016 strategy that the Senate and not the President should de determine when and under what circumstances a vacancy on the court is filled is, I suggest, uh, difficult to reconcile with the plain language of uh, the Appointments Clause. The second point I make is that the Senate does not discharge its advice and consent role when it is prevented by Senate leaders from actually considering a President's nomination. When asked to do so in 2016, the Senate neither advised upon or considered Judge Garland's nomination. The third point I make is this, that the power of the Senate to decline to consent to a nomination should not be confused with meaning that the Senate has the power to refuse to consider a nomination. The distinction is quite important. Senate consideration and rejection of a nomination is clearly permitted by Article 2, Section 2. By not considering Judge Garland's nomination, the Senate precluded a lawfully elected president from having the opportunity to appoint a judge to fill a vacancy on the court. The 2016 strategy meant that the Senate assumed for its political benefit the power to determine when and under what circumstances an appointment could be made to the court. Fourth, it is correct that the Appointments Clause does not say that the Senate shall give its advice and consent. And the reason for this, I think, is tolerably easy to understand. The Senate may legitimately decline to approve a nomination, and it would have been grammatically challenging if the Appointments Clause had said that the Senate shall advise and consent to a nomination when it has the option to withhold its consent. Fifth, the Senate's, uh, a Senate's authority to make rules to regulate its own procedures cannot be used as a vehicle to avoid the clear requirements of the Constitution which, which requires the President to nominate and to appoint when there is a vacancy on the Court. The sixth point I make is that the argument that as Congress can regulate the size of the court, then the Senate does, not, does nothing wrong by reducing the size of the court for a year ignores the fact that uh, changes to the size of the court can only be achieved through uh, legitimate legislative processes. It's not for the Senate to unilaterally determine the size of the court. 
And the seventh and final point I make uh, in relation to the arguments that have been advanced to justify the 2016 strategy is that the evidence concerning the original meaning of the appointments clause and the intentions of the drafters weighs uh, heavily against the arguments that have been advanced in support of the 2016 strategy. The Constitution Convention speeches of Alexander Hamilton, uh, James Madison, John Jay and Thomas Jefferson show that Article 2, Section 2 was not designed to confer equal power on the Senate and the President in relation to judicial nominations and appointments. As Hamilton explained, the political enforcement of checks and balances under the Constitution would occur through the confirmation process. He said, and I'm quoting from uh, the Federalist Papers 76 and 77, the blame of a bad nomination would fall upon the President singularly and absolutely. The censure for rejecting a good nominee would lie entirely at the door of the Senate, aggravated by the consideration of their having contravened the good intentions of the executive. Hamilton contemplated that the President's power to nominate and the Senate's uh, concomitant duty to consider any nominee as necessary checks to prevent the Senate from securing functional control over the appointments process. The founders clearly did not contemplate uh, the possibility of the Senate choosing which judicial nominations it would consider, and it was not contemplated that the Senate would assert power over the nomination process by refusing to consider a president's nomination. As we now know, the vacancy created by Justice Scalia's death remained for a record 293 days and enabled the new president to appoint as Justice Scalia's successor a justice who is perceived to inhabit the conservative spectrum of the court. The 2016 uh, strategy occurred in the context of a persistent erosion of constitutional and political norms governing judicial appointments. In 2003, Senator Reid led the blockade by Democrats of nominations by President George W. Bush to Federal Courts of Appeals position. And it was also Mr. Reid who orchestrated the change in 2016 to the Senate's long-standing practice of requiring 60, 60 votes to overcome a filibuster. When changing the votes required to overcome a filibuster, Mr. Reid argued that the departure from the long-standing previous practice was required because of the difficulties that Democrats were encountering in getting judicial nominations from President Obama confirmed by the Senate. At the time, the then Senate Minority Leader, Senator McConnell, warned that Senator Reid would regret implementing what was referred to as the nuclear option. And although Senator Reid's so-called nuclear option did not extend to Supreme Court nominations, Senator McConnell seized upon Senator Reid's reasoning to lower the vote threshold for the nomination of Justice Gorsuch to just 51. Other tactical steps taken in recent times include the ab abandonment of the blue slip rule, and more recently we have seen Mr McConnell endeavouring to redefine the 2016 strategy by saying uh, that there has been a tradition in place since 1880 whereby if a vacancy occurs in a presidential election year and there is a different party in control of the Senate, then the presidency, uh, then the presidency, then the vacancy is not filled. As noted uh, by Carl Hulse in his excellent book called Confirmation Bias, published just a few months ago, this is a very clear attempt by Mr. McConnell to set a new standard and to, and I'm quoting from Carl Hulse, provide cover to fill any vacancy that should occur on the court during 2020. The 2016 strategy has led to a number of commenta commentators arguing that if the Democrats regain control of the White House and Congress, then they should expand the size of the Supreme Court to ne negate the effect of the court's current 5-4 uh, conservative majority. These uh, uh, efforts have spawned an action group led by Professor Belkin, a political science professor at San Francisco State University, called Pack the Courts. And this uh, group is urging Democrat uh, presidential candidates to back its idea to expand the court to 12. 
in March, uh, former Attorney General Eric Holder said that the next Democrat president should seriously consider adding new seats to the court, and, and Mayor uh, Buttigieg has argued for an expansion of the court to 15. The genesis of this proposal is an article by Professors Epps and Sitaraman, in which, amongst other ideas to depoliticise the appointment of justices to the court, they suggest that five justices be nominated by each party and another five be nominated by the ten appointed justices. Now, in, expanding, in examining why expanding the size of the Supreme Court is a fraught idea, it's helpful to set the scene by looking at the history of the structure of the Supreme Court. Uh, when Congress passed the Judiciary Act of 1789, it provided for six justices of the Supreme Court, and that number reflected the judicial circuit system then in place. There were just three circuits, but each circuit uh, was at the time presided over by two Supreme Court justices and one district uh, court judge. The outgoing Federalist uh, Congress of 1801 reduced the size of the Supreme Court to five in an effort to try and uh, prevent uh, the incoming President uh, Jefferson from appointing a new member to the court. It transpired, however, that during his tenure as president, Jefferson was able to <coughs> appoint three justices to the court. That occurred because the incoming Democratic-Republican Congress quickly restored the size of the court to six. And then in 1807, when Congress established a new circuit to cover Ohio, Kentucky and Tennessee, the size of the court was expanded to seven. And then there was a vacancy that occurred during President Jefferson's uh, term, which enabled him to appoint three justices to the court. In 1837, when nine circuits were created, the size of the court was correspondingly increased to nine. But in 1863, the court was expanded to ten in recognition of California's induction into the Union. After Andrew Johnson became president, Congress moved to block his ability to make appointments to the court by reducing the size of the court to seven. But after uh, Grant was elected president, Congress passed the Judiciary Act of 1869, which, uh, restored the number, which increased the number of justices on the court to nine, which then corresponded with the number of circuits in place at the time. Now, the number of circuits was expanded to uh, expanded to 10 in, 18, in 1929 and then to 11 in 1980. But the number of seats on the court has remained at nine for exactly 150 years. <coughs> the changes made in 1801 and 1866 to reduce the number of seats on the court were designed to block the ability of first President Jefferson and then President Andrew Johnson to fill vacancies on the court. And these, I think, can be properly described as incidents of court unpacking. The first and only genuine attempt to expand the size of the court in order to assist a president achieve his political objectives occurred in 1937. The tipping point was reached when the court delivered its decision in the Moorhead case. That was the tenth decision from the court decided between January 1935 and June 1936, in which it had struck down New Deal-related legislation. It was that decision which prompted President Franklin Roosevelt to advance a plan to expand by six the number of justices on the court, one for every justice over 70 years of age. This plan was promoted on the pretext that the court was overworked and that sitting justices were too old to cope with the pressures of sitting on the nation's highest court. There were two primary uh, sources of backlash to the President's plans. First was the justices of the court themselves. Under the uh, careful leadership of Chief Justice Hughes, uh, the Chief Justice uh, enlisted the assistance of Justices Van de Venter and Justice Brandeis in writing a seven-page letter setting out the arguments as to why the court was able to cope with its workload. The fact that the Chief Justice sought the support of Justices uh, Van de Venter and Justice Brandeis in writing his letter reflected the unanimous opposition there was from the court to the President's proposal. The Chief Justice gave that letter to Democratic Senator Burton Wheeler, who was opposed to the Judicial Procedures Reform Bill 
and who ensured that the Chief Justice's letter opposing the President's court-packing packing plan was very widely publicised. The second uh, source of opposition was political. Perhaps most surprising to the President was the level of opposition to his court-packing plan from his own party. According to Jeffrey Sheshaw, the author of the wonderful book Supreme Power, Franklin Roosevelt vs. the Supreme Court, it was the duplicity of the President's plan that generated political opposition in his own party. Senior Democrats were unimpressed that the President was attempting to disguise his political manoeuvrings with a plan that was put forward on the false basis that he was trying to achieve court efficiencies. As we now know, when the first Justice Roberts cast his vote in the West Coast Hotel and Parish case in favour of upholding the constitutionality of the minimum wage legislation passed by Washington State, the real political justification for the President's court packing plan began to unravel. It was, however, a stunning setback for one of this country's most popular presidents when his court packing uh, proposal failed. President uh, Roosevelt did nevertheless achieve his goals in transforming the composition of the court. He was able to appoint a total of nine justices of the court between August 1937 and February of 1943. Probably the real reason for the visceral objection to President Roosevelt's court packing plan was the fear that such a measure would dramatically change the balance of political influence over the composition of the court. Absent court packing measures, the executive must bide its time and await vacancies on the court before it can appoint new justices. This has had some anomalous consequences. President Carter was one of four presidents who did not get to nominate anyone to the court, whereas Presidents uh, Jackson, Lincoln, Taft and Franklin Roosevelt, between them, managed to appoint 25 justices to the court. Expanding the size of, of the court would involve creating a number of new appointments at one time, which in turn is likely to generate the uh, deleterious consequences of court packing that I'll now move on to discuss. So why is court packing such a fraught idea? It's easy to see why Democrats are frustrated. They view the treatment of Judge Garland's nomination as at worst a violation of the Constitution, or at best a violation of the convention that the Senate should at least consider nominations by a president for a position on the Supreme Court. That frustration would be further compounded if, during the course of 2020, a vacancy should occur on the court and the president and the Senate appoint a new justice to the court. Political frustration is, however, not a reason for taking the radical step of expanding the size of the Supreme Court in an effort to address political wrongs. And the reasons for this can be distilled to three concerns. First, the court's reputation. Second, the risk to the rule of law. And third, the uh, annihilation of constitutional conventions. And I'll deal with each now, starting with the court's reputation. Throughout its history, there have been periods when the court's political neutrality has been called into question. The first years of uh, Jefferson's presidency and the periods between 1935 and 1937 when President Roosevelt's uh, New Deal legislation was being struck down by the court are two examples of when the court's political neutrality was very much in question. It's also fair to say that the, the dissatisfaction that some today have with the court may be traced to its 2000 decision in uh, Bush v. Gore. The current uh, partisan 5-4 division on the court reflects the politics of the presidents who nominated them. This concern is well recognised. Justice Kagan last year warned that it was, and I'm quoting from her, a dangerous time for the court because and I continue her, what she said, people increasingly look at us and say this is just an extension of the political process. The means by which Justices Gorsuch and Kavanaugh came to be on the court have compounded concerns that the court's <coughs> reputation for political neutrality is rapidly eroding. As <coughs> Professors Epstein and Posner have explained, 
Justice Kennedy was the last justice on the court to regularly vote against the ideology of the president who appointed him. Justice Kennedy has been replaced by a much more conservative justice. They note, thus, for the first time in living memory, the court will be seen by the public as a party-dominated institution. One who votes on controversial issues are essentially determined by a party affiliation of recent presidents. In the past, the court has been able to weather periods of turbulence and usually it has emerged as an even stronger institution. Marbury and Madison was to some degree a product of the deep divide between the Federalists and the Jefferson regime. Roosevelt's New Deal statutes began to be upheld by the court in 1937 and within a short period of time, that president was able to appoint more just justices to the Supreme Court than any other uh, president in the country's his history other than Washington. And the current well-founded concerns that the court is becoming uh, politicised will, I suggest, increase dramatically if the size of the court is expanded in order to avenge political wrongdoing. It is likely that court packing measures will dismantle any remaining public confidence that the court has the ability to be politically neutral. My second concern is the undermining of the rule of law. The seeds of the struggle for power between the three branches of government were sown in the Constitution itself, under which members of the court are appointed through the combined efforts of the other two branches of government. The struggle for power between the so-called equal branches of government is a battle that the court lacks the resources to fight. It has, after all, just one function, namely to decide cases and controversies. As shown by the desegregation of schools, the court is dependent on the executive to enforce its judgment, and of course it relies on Congress to provide the funds required, the salaries, and to, run the cost, uh, and to meet the costs of running the court. Notwithstanding uh, its vulnerable position, the court has repeatedly overruled and challenged the objectives of Congress and the executive. That it has done so successfully is even more remarkable when we reflect on the fact that from time to time, the court has not only acted out of step with the popular will, but it has also been wrong. Dred Scott was indefensible and many of the judgments striking down New Deal legislation were acknowledged to have been wrongly decided in subsequent decisions. The success of the court has in large measure been the product of at times begrudging willingness of the other branches of government to accept its decisions as legitimate because the court professes to abstain from party politics. To quote Justice Robert Jackson, this court speaks through the technical forms of the lawsuit which are not uh, aligned with the politics of its prop in its properly accepted sense. There is, however, a genuine risk that court packing for political purposes will undermine the court's legitimacy when the political composition of one or more of the other branches of government does not coincide with those who were responsible for expanding the size of the court. Proponents of court packing can rightly argue that any breakdown of the law of law, rule of law by partisan rejection of the court's decisions would be the fault of those who don't respect the court's decision. Court packing, however, is likely to create a very contentious environment that could quickly trigger a rejection of the court's decisions. And this can, can and ought to be avoided at all costs. Now, the final point I wish to make concerns the undermining of constitutional conventions. Uh, we are living in an era in which political conduct and strategy is driven by extreme ideology. This trait reflects an uncompromising approach that, that those vested with political power take towards anyone else who is perceived to have a different viewpoint. We have been warned that even more uncompromising measures may be in store by Senator Graham, who proclaimed, and I'm quoting from him, the worst is yet to come when the Senate Judicial Committee disregarded the Blue Chip uh, Slip Convention. This winner takes all approach to political decision making, uh, places to one side any notion that politicians are merely the stewards of the offices they hold. <coughs> 
America is not alone in experiencing this phenomenon. The United Kingdom is now trying to reconcile the fact that it is led by a Prime Minister who was willing to mislead the Queen when seeking to prorogue Parliament and who uh, promptly terminated the careers of 21 senior members of his own party who had the audacity to vote against him in Brexit-related uh, measures uh, that were before the House of Commons. Political and constitutional conventions are amongst the first casualties of this political firestorm. And for the balance of this talk, I will just focus upon constitutional conventions. It was in 1863 that Albert D uh, Dicey, who uh, was the source of the phrase, the rule of law, wrote that the conduct of political actors are governed by two parallel but interconnected sets of rules. He, he described the second of these as the understandings, the habits or practices that are not really rule laws since they are not enforced by the courts, but the conventions of the constitution or constitutional morality. Constitutional conventions are the oil that lubricates the machinery of democratic government. They fill the voids created by constitutions, legislations and the common law and they provide a very uh, invaluable counterbalance to what is otherwise unacceptable conduct. Now we know that uh, conventions can play a very important role in constitutional interpretation uh, as uh, confirmed by the court in the Noel Canning case, uh, but it is really the role, of the role that constitutional conventions play in regulating a significant portion of the decision-making and conduct of actors that is so significant, not only in the American model of democracy, but also in all Western-styled democracies. Thus, whilst the text of the Constitution is the primary source of my concerns about the 2016 strategy over the nomination of Judge Garland, historical practice and conventions are also of crucial importance. There are many who argue that the 2016 strategy not to consider the nomination of Judge Garland was not contrary to the terms of the Constitution. Even if that argument is correct, the refusal to even consider the nomination of an elected president to fill a judicial vacancy breached a long-standing norm that requires such nomination to be at least considered by the Senate. Prior to the nomination of Judge Garland, there had been 103 instances in which an elected president nominated someone to fill a Supreme Court vacancy and began that process prior to the election of the president's successor. In all 103 cases, the sitting president was able to both nominate and appoint a replacement justice by and with the advice and consent of the Senate. Sometimes the President had to make more than one nomination, but in no case was there a precedent for the 2016 strategy. Professors Carr and uh, Mazon have written an excellent article published in the 2016 New York uh, Law Review uh, in which they demonstrate that while Senate Republicans framed their opposition to the nomination of Judge Garland in historic practices, their plan, in fact, presented a major departure from more than two centuries of historical tradition. Incidentally, there have been in the past, in uh, 1845, 1851 and 1866, three instances <coughs> in which a vice president, upon assuming the office of president, was unable to progress a nomination uh, through uh, the Senate process. Um, those incidents occurred at a time when there were some doubts about what powers the vice president actually acquired when assuming the, uh, the office of presidency. And those doubts were uh, subsequently addressed through the passing of the 25th Amendment. There have also been three historic cases in which a sitting president sought to nominate a person to fill a Supreme Court vacancy after the sitting president's successor had actually been elected and the Senate responded in all three cases by transferring to the newly elected president the opportunity to make the, uh, the appointment in question. I'm sure we can all agree that 
these uh, two types of cases provide no precedent for the 2016 strategy. After conducting an exhaustive study of all Supreme Court nominations and appointments, Professors Carr and Mazzone conclusively established that the convention in this country is, and I'm quoting from them, whenever a Supreme Court vacancy has existed during an elected president's term and the president has acted prior to the election of a successor, the sitting president has been able to both nominate and appoint someone to fill the relevant <coughs> vacancy by and with the advice and consent of the Senate. Some opponents argue that court packing legislation risks triggering a spiral of further court packing measures when political powers change sufficiently to enable this to happen. I don't know how realistic that fear is and I don't want to explore it any further. It might be something we can discuss later. My more fundamental concern is that changing the size of the court for overtly political reasons will further undermine the existing fragile constitutional conventions and signal that such conventions can no longer serve the functions for which they were devised. In other words, court packing will eliminate any chance of adhering to conventions when further court appointments are required. The type of doomsday scenario that may occur is a refusal by the Senate to consider any judicial nomination from the President when the President and the majority of the Senate are from different political parties. This isn't a fanciful, a fanciful fear. There were more than hints of this in 2016 when at least three Republican Senators said that if Mrs Clinton won the White House, then uh, they would not consider any not person whom she nominated to fill the vacancy on the court created by Justice Scalia's passing. Expanding the size of the court for political reasons or as political payback is a frank acknowledgement that conventions can no longer fulfill their vital functions and such an outcome is not sustainable. I know that coming from a stable democracy such as uh, my own, that it's um, uh, perhaps not polite for me to uh, comment too much about uh, the United States politics, but it is imperative for both Republican and Democratic politicians to recognise the importance of upholding the conventions that ensure the survival of constitutional and democratic structures. It was wrong of the Senate not to consider Judge Garland's nomination to the seat created by the death of Justice Scalia. That wrong, however, cannot be used as a justification for an even more egregious wrong, namely packing the court in retaliation for the 2016 strategy. What both sides of the political divide need to do is recognise that they are the temporary stewards of the powers that are bestowed upon them and discharge those powers with honour and with dignity by adhering to the conventions that are critical to the health of all democracies. Thank you. Thank you. I'm very, very happy to take uh, questions and uh, particularly <coughs> questions from anyone who disagrees with me. <laughs> Surely there must be some dissent. <laughs> Well, I'd be happy to get us started. <laughs> I, I prefer to hear from the students, but I'll, I'll get us started if no one else wants to. Yes. So, you know, I debated court packing with a number of the folks that you mentioned, yes. um, and I've come down on your side. And, and a reason I've given, in addition to the good reasons you've given, is, uh, you know, legitimacy always exists in the mind of an audience. You're talking about public legitimacy. You're talking about why politicians with power abide decisions they hate. Yeah. I'm also concerned about what's going on in the minds of the justices that whatever you think about the kind of politics John Roberts is practicing, it's different than the kind of politics Mitch McConnell is practicing. Yes. And we all have a huge stake in preserving those differences. Yeah. Uh, and court packing, uh, I am worried that would, would threaten to obliterate the differences that remain. Uh, the idea being, why should we try to act like judges and not politicians when we're being treated? just like politicians. So I think that, that that's a different argument than yes. I heard from you, yes, and I think it's worth thinking about. On the other hand, right? Um, are you suggesting that there are no circumstances at all in which court packing would be appropriate, uh, no matter what the Supreme Court does? We've now got a Supreme Court 
that is, some would say, substantially more conservative than the nation as a whole. And it's, for the first time in American history, a product of a president who lost the popular vote successfully nominating two justices who were confirmed by a majority of the Senate that represents a minority of the nation. Right? So actual democratic legitimacy, one might argue, doesn't exist. No matter how extreme, no matter how far they go, would you say court packing right, is never appropriate? Yes. Now, I think John Roberts is too savvy to ever get close to that point. Um, some would say he's already surpassed it. right? Um, uh, but are you really saying no, never? Or to give you another possibility, what if it turns out that we can determine with a high degree of confidence that a president who made decisive appointments to the court was not legitimately elected? It was a result of illegal behavior. Is there any way to undo the damage for the next 30 or 40 years, given life tenure, except by making additional appointments to neutralize the long-term impact of that illegitimately elected president's nomination? Well, uh, you put forward two uh, very uh, strong arguments for court packing. I personally think it's a step too far, and um, I would hate to see a situation arise where uh, court packing is justified purely out of political, uh, as political uh, payback or as a political response uh, to decisions that are made by the justices. Um, you know, fundamentally, the Constitution says that the answer lies in if, the populace being able to elect its uh, politicians every four years, and uh, well, the president every four years. Um, and that, I think, has to be the uh, touchstone by which all these decisions are measured. Hi. Hi. Uh, I'm interested in what possible remedies there might have been to the 2016 strategy other than wait and see. So clearly the decision was made to just wait uh, and the hope was that um, Obama's pick would be able to continue under a new Democratic um, administration. Yeah. Um, or, or a different moment. Right. Uh, so the, the question is, would a suit filed either by Obama or Democratic members of the Senate have even been justiciable? Hmm. <laughs> no. <laughs> I, I, I mean, it seems like this is a problem without, any, without, a, without a solution. Yeah. Um, you will signally no. Uh, <laughs> I, I, that's, it, it, that was my, my thought. But yeah, I yeah, yeah. I, I think uh, the, the imperfections of the Constitution are very, very clear in this situation. Uh, well, given that there's no solution, yeah. does that open more leeway for a radical solution, which is constitutional, like court pact? Um, again, uh, I come back to the point that uh, I think uh, when it is done for purely political purposes to achieve political ends, then that's a step too far. Hi. I, I, I guess it's just so, would this really be a political movement if you view the two justices that have been appointed as not really being legitimately appointed? So due to, one, the 2016 strategy, and then two, with uh, all of the, everything that happened with the Kavanaugh hearings. Sure. So would this not just be another way to try to restore the legitimacy of the court when a lot of the American public really feel it doesn't have that legitimacy anymore? Sure. Well, the solution in relation to the Kavanaugh uh, situation is if he was not legitimately appointed because, for, for argument's sake, that he misled the Senate, then the answer lies in the, the processes that are set out in the Constitution for his removal. Um, that doesn't require a court-packing measure. It's a little more difficult in relation to Justice Gorsuch's uh, appointment, uh, and I understand why many people regard him as not having been legitimately appointed, but the reality is he was. He was appointed by a duly elected president of this country, uh, following the nomination from that president and through the advice and consent of the Senate. And uh, it's galling for many, I understand, but it's nevertheless lawful. Hi. Hi. Um, 
I'd like to hear your perspective, I think, on gerrymandering generally and how, uh, how and whether packing the court is just a different kind of gerrymandering and a different branch of government um, and how you perceive legitimacy and rule of law um, in terms of how it has or hasn't been damaged by gerrymandering. And is this, are we talking about the same kind of thing here? Well, I, I'd like to think that there, that there are differences. And um, gerrymandering seems to be a uniquely uh, American phenomenon. It, it really does, and uh, there are all sorts of reasons for that. So uh, in most other British Commonwealth, Commonwealth jurisdictions, politicians don't have a, any direct influence over the electoral boundaries and the size of electorates. It's all done by independent commissions. So, and judicial appointments are actually, in some ways, far less transparent in those jurisdictions than they are in the United States. So, uh, in my country and in a number of common law countries, appointments to a high judicial, all judicial office actually, are made by the Attorney General, uh, who simply gives a, advice to the Governor General on behalf of the Queen that it's time that we appoint David Collins to the High Court. Um, now, the Chief Justice has consulted over that, but it's all done behind closed doors. So I don't, didn't have to appear before any uh, legislative committee. I didn't have to justify my, uh, all my law review articles. And none of that, none of that happened. Just one day, the Attorney General puts out an announcement, and that's it. Uh, I get a piece of paper from the Queen saying, I'm one of your judges. Um, now, that's remarkably untransparent uh, by American standards. But, you know, it seems to work. At least I think it works. <laughs> uh, because we do achieve a, a, a remarkable diversity on our bench through that process. And with one exception of my country's history, we have never had an issue over, um, the, uh, over, a, over a judicial appointment and the one issue which we had was really, by most people's standards, an error of judgment by that judge, which resulted in them resigning. Um, now, I've gone around and around avoiding answering your question. <laughs> and that is because I think, as I reflect on it, there is quite a difference, really, between gerrymandering for purely political purposes to achieve political powers and the use of legitimate well, I'm sorry, and the use of processes that ensure that a president and a senate um, achieve appointments that they feel more comfortable with. But that doesn't mean to say that 2016 was right. Far from it. I think it was an outrageous uh, uh, part of American constitutional history. Yeah. I'm curious to know if you have ideas or recommendations for depoliticizing the nomination process. It US. would require constitutional change. And what would that require? Um, I'd get rid of a tenure for life. I'd have a 16-year appointment. Uh, and um, no one sitting beyond 75. Mm -hmm. 75? 75, yeah. Mm -hmm. Which is retirement age for uh, senior judges of United Kingdom, Canada, and our country in Australia, it's too low, 70. So I'm, mm -hmm. <laughs> in four and a half years, I suddenly become officially senile and incapable of doing my job. <laughs> Sorry. I just want to follow up on, on your idea there. I'm a little concerned about the idea of a lame duck justice when you know that justice is about to be aged out or come yeah. to the end of that term um, in, in an apex court like that. Um, how would that structure avoid a sort of strategic timing of cases in order to avoid a justice? Yeah, it just doesn't happen. Okay. It, it simply never happens because um, the justices understand full well that they have to discharge their oath fully and fairly and transparently. Mm -hmm. And to 
avoid a case because you might be retiring it would be completely contrary to uh, every principle of judicial conduct. Oh, well, uh, not the justice reti- oh, doing that, the, the, the people filing mm-hmm. the cases. Uh, you know, that takes a fair bit of manoeuvring. And, uh, and, and in any event, uh, for, so for, say, the Supreme Court of England and Wales, there are 12 justices. They normally sit as a panel of five, so you, you can't be guaranteed what you're going to get. Uh, Canada is probably a little more closer to the problem that you're thinking about because I think there's nine. Is, uh, any, is there anyone from Canada here? Nine or ten? I think we actually just looked at that, and that, that was the yeah. question that came up on, yeah. about Canada. And uh, uh, High Court of Australia, High, Australia being Australia, their yeah. highest court is called the High Court. <laughs> um, they normally sit as a panel of seven out of. Uh, normally sit as a panel of five out of seven uh, that they have on their court. And in New Zealand, we have. Uh, we've a- actually added a sixth justice to our court, but uh, they only ever sit as a panel of five. So most of the time you can't, you can't sort out who's going to be your judge. <laughs> David, did you mean 18 years as opposed to 16 years? Because if you don't want to change... Oh, sorry, the, 18. Yeah, right, because if you don't 18. want to change the size of the court, if you want to yeah. keep it at nine, then every two years someone's on and someone's off. That's it. And, I, and as you're thinking that, that would depoliticize in response to uh, Melinda because everyone knows it's regularized. You're going to do this every two years. It lowers the stakes of any one nomination. They're not going to be sitting for the next 40 years. Yes. Mm-hmm. I think there is there, there are substantial upsides, but there are also downsides, right? So when the end game sits in and the justices are thinking about their next career move, yeah. they may not be entirely identified with the judiciary. They might be thinking about what they're doing next. Yeah. There's also a real concern about stability. Given how polarized this country is, unlike New Zealand, and given how far apart some of these justices are, I mean, you could have radical, unless the justices, it's a collective action problem, unless they self-consciously are constantly mindful of this, you could have gigantic swings in the law of abortion, race, gerrymandering, what have you, every two years, right? Or every three years, right, when the new cases are heard. So, I mean, there are problems that we need to deal with. Yeah. If, if they took senior status like a, an appellate judge mm-hmm. and, and that was kind of the expectation and they'd be probably most of them would be 75. Um, not much you can do after 75. <laughs> not all that. The private sector isn't like hung, hungry. For <laughs> 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 just, uh, it sounds like a creed occur. <laughs> 75 isn't what it used to be. <laughs> it's younger. <laughs> As I get closer to it. But I think, I think the expectation is they take senior, they take mm-hmm. senior status. They'd, they'd sit on the courts of appeal and they'd, they'd actually enjoy that. So I, I don't think it would be, I think from their point, a lot of these schemes, the, the, worry, the worry was, well, the justices will be looking at the lawyers practicing before them as potential lawyers and that will. Depends when they're appointed, David. Well, it's an it eighteen-year term. It does, but if you're not going to be appointed the, the, at sixty, the, the reason presidents are appointing so young <laughs> is that they're hoping they'll still be there for forty. Yeah. If they know they're going to be there for eighteen, they're matter. going to appoint people. That One hope. Yeah. Well, I, I, I think so. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. But it's going to require a constitutional change and get that chance of that. <laughs> <laughs> I think your other point, though, has a lot. Say for it is like this is be changing the court constantly, and yeah. that's 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 harder. Yeah, well, I don't know because Supreme Court of England and Wales it's constantly evolving and constantly changing, and nobody seems to have any issues or concerns about that. All the other Commonwealth uh, final courts where there's a mandatory retiring age. It's often thought that it's really healthy to have rejuvenation mm-hmm. and fresh minds being brought to bear, and there isn't really the dramatic swings, but then these courts aren't dealing with the massive constitutional issues that the Supreme Court is dealing with. Yeah, that's the problem with the comparative, and is how polarized are the societies and the parties and how much power are the courts exercising? Yeah. Right, so I'm not sure England is an apt comparison. Yeah. But, you know, the South African Constitutional Court exercises significant power. That's true. Um, I don't know how, I know that they're polarized the way we are uh, yeah. in terms of the parties. So your reasoning on the 2016 strategy, would it apply also to the way in which both parties have held 
nominations to the lower courts in the last year, let's say, yeah. of a president. It would. Yeah. So that that's equally illegitimate. Yeah. I I, th I think maybe you know that's that's sort of where this idea kind of germinated. Yeah. And I, I I've I've sat through very ugly sessions where senators from each party are accusing the others of holding nominations, and you held more than I held. Yeah. Uh, and what about this person? What about that person? You know, John Roberts was held and and didn't make it the first time. And you know, we all know people. Um, we can all recite people that have been held. They both were. They've both been doing it yeah. for some time now. And maybe, uh, maybe that just that ha that kind of crept up on us. Maybe. Yeah. And that's really an Ill as well illegitimate. Yes. You know, they should have voted. Yeah. Exactly. But I think it is a problem for your view, David, because your constitutional text analysis, your original analysis, is aiming at historical practice is very different. Yeah. There's much more of an historical practice of doing what this David is talking about in the last year of a president's term. Right. And one potential difference is that the U.S. Supreme Court is different. Yeah. It's the only federal court the Constitution requires the existence of. Yeah. Sure. Judges can't sit by designation. They can't visit. It's a real big deal if they have eight and they're split, you know, they're evenly divided, right? I mean, the impact on the Supreme Court of being on the receiving end of this behavior is unlike any other federal court. But that's not just an argument about the text of the appointments clause yeah. or, or the original understanding. Yeah. Well. Okay. <laughs> you open up a can of worms. Yeah. <laughs> Tomorrow you'll talk about something much less controversial, like the institution of judicial review. <laughs> <laughs> okay, stay tuned. Thank you very much. Thank you.